very much for doing this. I, I deeply Probably. appreciate it. Um, so let's start with, with the question of Ali that everybody's talking about now. You've written on one book on him, both written new articles about him. Everybody's talking about him. Kevin, there was something that you wrote about specifically I wanted us to start with, if you don't mind, this mm -hmm. question of you took it back to his grandmother, great-grandmother, Dinah? Great-great-grandmother. Great so when you're reflecting on Ali, why go back to Dinah, and how did that factor into your reflection on uh, Kevin about Kevin took it to Harriet Tubman. I know, but... but He's not playing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. Exactly. Exactly. Well, exactly. Because we do not pay attention enough in this country to the history of the progeny of enslaved Africans and what that means to where we're at now, knowing from whence we came. And I think I started out the piece talking about African burial right. customs right. and how you leave something on top, of the, on top of the mound to remind everyone else of who this person was and is. And I think it's important to know that Cassius Clay Muhammad Ali is a progeny of enslaved Africans and it's something that he never, ever, ever forgot. I mean, he didn't have to make a strong pronouncement about it, but just think about it. At a time when he became a national celebrity, so many black male national celebrities did something very similar. They conked their hair. He never did. And shortly thereafter, he's talking about blackness versus whiteness. And he never let go of that, of that comparison as to where he was and where everybody else was. And so I think it's important for people to understand that he understood that he was the progeny of Dinah. And I've since heard that he was also the progeny of a previous Cassius Clay who was somewhat of a revolutionary black man in Kentucky. Um, but that I don't know that much about. I just, I've just heard about that. I, I could speak a little bit. First of all, thanks for having me Amen. so much. And yeah, you, you just said so much, Kevin. I'd uh, love to, to speak about. I mean, just this idea of saying, I'm so pretty, I'm so beautiful, right. basically right. Right. projecting the idea that black is beautiful ahead of that curve. And which is why I think he is so revered because it's almost like his head, his headspace was somewhere where masses of people's headspace would be. And so he becomes that compass for so many people. And his bravery and courage becomes a compass for so many people. I, just want to say, um, I would want to say very quickly, it would be behind the curve if we're talking about the movements going back to like Marcus Garvey's. Well, that's what I was just about to say. But in terms of this just, pop culture, media, yeah. athletic, entertainment, modern civil rights era, he was, in, in that way, I think, rightly ahead of the curve. Right? I was just about, you, you took some words out of my mouth because what does Cassius Clay's father and Malcolm's father have in common? Like, both deeply influenced by Garvey. Right. And so there's historical continuity there. Like, it's not like this stuff came out of thin air. The same way him saying, like, I am the greatest. I mean, that's very linked and connected to Nation of Islam ideology. Black man is God. And... And it's, it's an amazing thing when you see Cassius Clay and then Muhammad Ali contextually because it allows us to understand who he was, where he came from, and where these influences came from. Otherwise, it just really does look like, you know, he's like sprung from, you know, I don't know, the loins of the hybrid of, of I don't know, Vathina and Paul Robeson. And, and that doesn't really help anybody, you know. But you both, in, in a way, you, you both touched on it already and in your pieces have... In, in, in your own ways dealt with this question of, of what Ali saw himself connected to doesn't always appear in the narratives as they relate to us after the, after, you know, posthumously about him. Or, or not just even posthumously, over the last 30, 40 years, right. this recreated image of Ali 
and this is something I wanted to ask you about in terms of the, the, the torch piece, how, how, how different people interpreted that. Because for me, watching that in 90, what was it, 96? 96, mm -hmm. right. It was, it was a defeat of this, this man who in my lifetime had been imaged as the anti-establishment mm -hmm. radical, now being brought in as the symbolic. And that's almost the only version of him we're getting in these, these posthumous commemorations. Right. And I think both of you have importantly tried to remind your audiences that there are these other traditions and connections that he at least saw himself having and, and that aren't always considered. Yeah. Two, two things real quick, and then um, I don't want to bogart the mic, so I'll no, get no, to you. No. But this, this really, it does bother me a great deal that um, Bob Costas, uh, Ali's body is barely cold. His heart might have even still been beating because we heard that after he was taken off life support, his heart That's beat right, right, right. for 30 minutes after his organs shut down. And... And Bob Costas is talking about the greatness of Muhammad Ali, how he stood up. And then he also said, and he grew out of his, mis this is the words he used, misguided association with the Nation of Islam. And to me, you know, that's really like saying, gee, um, I really love this pie, but I hate the filling. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like you have to accept every, what he is and reckon with it. Because there is no, I am the greatest without the Nation of Islam. There is no draft resistance without the Nation of Islam. And so you, you can't pick and choose like it's a buffet, like about how somebody developed politically along their journey. You got it. But that's what I'm seeing, though. The recreation of the of the image is the picking and choosing, and this happens yeah. to everybody. Yeah. Right? There's an attempt to re-image so many great individuals. You mentioned Harriet Tubman in your piece. Yeah. I mean, the same kind of thing. Well, well, let's let's focus on her when in this moment, <laughs> not these. Right. And Same with Ali. And it, it's usually a moment that is both politically palatable, right. and a moment that favors white power, right. basically. That's right. Like something that makes white people look like, like I'll tell you like an example of this is you have to talk about Cassius Clay. Where does his name come from? Um, and it, his name, like is, he was named obviously after his father because he was Cassius Marcellus Clay Jr. But his father, Cassius Marcellus Clay Sr. was named after a white abolitionist in Kentucky who got in fist fights on the floor of the house in Kentucky because he was so staunchly against slavery. Fine and good. But people use that as a way, and got some, some idiot state rep was on Twitter was using it as a way to bash Muhammad Ali for changing his name today. Been like, why would you change your name from someone who was for abolition? It's like, because it's still a slave name. That's the point. Change you know, name to be a free man. To be a free man. It, so it, it, that part is very bothersome. Now, there, there's more to say about that, but I'm going to pass the mic to you. Yeah, well, you know, I'll just say I, I think the transformation or... Um, disfiguration, I'll call it, um, began when it came out that he was stricken with Parkinson's. Um, and I think that um, I think that softened some people's critique of him because now he was a sick man. And you saw it play out over TV, in interviews, and some empathy, I think, catharsis, right, was developed. Um, but I think the 96 Olympics was that moment, which angered you because it appeared as if, and he was, being used for the Olympics. Um, and here he was teetering with Parkinson's, and we're praying that he doesn't fall into the cauldron himself, right? And then the story comes out, um, uh, that he, in fact, or not in fact, but he lost the medal and didn't throw it to the bottom of the Ohio River, which makes him appear as less defiant, less militant, yep. and more palatable. More palatable. Right. And so now, that's what we, that's what most people are remembering. And they're forgetting that the FBI was investigating him through his own beloved trainer, Angelo Dundee and his brother Chris Dundee. You know, what he went through the moment he changed his name, the World Boxing Association stripped the title from him just for changing your name, just for exercising religious freedom in a country that stands for religious freedom. Yeah. I mean, you, in, your, in, in, in your piece, Kevin, you talk about him being an unrelenting grizzly who was re-imaged as a cuddly teddy bear. Exactly. And I can't remember... Actually, I'm not sure where... 
you, both one of you or both of you can correct me on this. Where if I got it, I want to say I got it from you, but I can't remember where. Well, this is what I, what, I, what I wanted to ask, though, because it wasn't just what the state or, or media were trying to do in terms of reimaging him, right. but that his widow had helped him craft a, a, a sort of retirement image himself, right? That they, she he, had. That he did have, or they had agency. It wasn't just what was being done to him, that he was also trying to... Right. He's... He sold his name Crap for a little bit, you know, so, X million. So what do we say about that? Yeah. He sold his he sold and his then, name for X million dollars. And before we, I'm sorry, because right. I want the, I want you to finish that point because you were the the point about the medals is something you also had to correct, or at least challenge in terms of the, the narrative, which is important to this story. You know, the, right. that he didn't just lose the the medal. Right, right. He, he he didn't lose it. He 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 threw it to the bottom of the Ohio River after he was uh, denied service at a restaurant in Louisville and he's saying I want the gold I can come back right. and, and who's that I'm right then I, I'm, I'm an American like everyone and this was a reminder that in fact you weren't you were just a nigga with a gold medal um, now whether that story is true or not the fact of the matter is it is certainly metaphorical for his life uh, because he cast his career out the window for what he believed in, which was righteousness, and because he felt he was being wronged. Um, so they, there's, there's really no debate about that, but it's just interesting that people have pulled at that thread over time, and, and, and I think to make him appear more malleable than he really was. And, and he, he's at a point, he be, he's been at a point for years now where he can't speak for himself. And here was someone who we grew up with Knowing him as a Louisville Lip, <laughs> who yeah. I mean, as, always had something to my, say. As my comrade Todd Burroughs reminds us, I mean, this was a guy not for for a lot of us growing up without our black father. Like he represented oh so much. We see him, and then we so not only this this brash, super you know right. powerful, but then in comics he's beating up Superman. Superman I beat Superman. Superman. Put him on the put him on the cover. Him Knocked him out. out Superman. I mean, so you got. Like, I mean, I remember. Herbert <laughs> Muhammad's a character in that comic. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember, <laughs> I remember sitting in our kitchen, listening to the round by round description of the first Ali Frazier fight, and when they said in the 14th round that Ali had been knocked down, I was devastated because he was my real superhero. He was invincible. And Dave, as you get the, the mic, remind us of the line that Ali said that you that you reminded us of as you came to greet us today that relates to, to oh. what, this, this issue of, of Ali's experience post-Olympics coming back with that medal. Well, yeah, and this is part of the whole argument about Ali. Like, if I was teaching it to somebody who never had heard of him before, it's a, I would say, please understand that Ali doesn't happen without the 1960s, and the 1960s maybe don't happen, though, without Ali. And, like, if you would ask 18-year-old Cassius Clay in 1960, who's your hero and what are your goals? Who's your hero would have been a pro wrestler named Gorgeous George Wagner. And what's your goal? He would say to be the heavyweight champion and bring the showmanship of professional wrestling into boxing. I mean, the descriptions when he first met Gorgeous George, and he was like 19, like kid in a candy store, like lost his mind. And, and you could see the way he appropriated a lot of those wrestling tropes, particularly the idea which he did throughout his entire career, like through Frazier and, and, and Spinks, like this idea of like, hey, let, let's sell some tickets and do our thing and let's be loud. Right, right. The problem with, maybe we could talk about this later, like with Joe Frazier, Joe Frazier wasn't playing. And so you can go too far sometimes and, and, it, and it hurts. But make sure everybody's in agreement. Yeah, you got to make sure everybody knows you're about to do it. Yeah. It's like, I'm going to call you ugly. Okay, that's okay. I'm going to say you're for Nixon. All right, that'll sell some tickets. And I'm going to say you're a gorilla. Wait, what? <laughs> Wait, what? He goes, no, no, camera's on. Sh -sh, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so you better be careful. So um, so in 1960, though, he comes back and he's already like in full pro wrestling mode, full toasting mode, which is part of it, too. Like this idea of uh, like I still think he one of his gifts of what he did was that he took uh, these totems of black identity and brought them to a white audience. So like things like saying I'm so pretty, that would not have been new. Oh, I'm, and, and being a straight man and being like, I, I'm, I'm so pretty. That would not have been new in a black context, nor would toasting be new in a black context. But you take that 
to white America, people lose their damn minds. Like, what is he talking about? Who is this person? That's why it's so stupid when you hear, like, he invented rap. Right, well, it's like, no. it's like, com- what? No, <laughs> not quite. And, and, but, but he came back, I'm sorry, I'm babbling, because he said, to make America the greatest is my goal. So I beat a Russian and I beat a Pole, and then I won the medal of gold. And the Greeks said, you're better than the Cassius of old. And everybody was like, ho, ho, he rhymes. And thought it was amazing. But within within four years, if you'd ask him, what's your hero and what's your goal? Hero would have been Malcolm X and goal would have been and white supremacy by any means necessary. So you, you, a massive transformation because of the social climate had taken place. And But the question, though, about like when he became cuddly or when they tried to make him cuddly is a really interesting one to me because... In the late 60s, he's being bugged. He's being bugged by Richard Nixon. Right. By 1975, he's with Gerald Ford, right. this figure of reconciliation. 1984, he publicly said, and he still could speak, he said that he was endorsing for president Jesse Jackson and Ronald Reagan. So, you know, this idea of, like, I'm bringing everybody together. And, you know, I got to say, like, I don't, I'm not hating for that at all. And I'm not even criticizing because it's like the movements of the 60s, they withered, right. and I'll never say died because people who are still fight from that time will knock your head off That's if you right. say died. Right. But the movements withered, and when they withered, you really had a choice. You could be, you know, for all his faults, I will, I will stand by this. You could be Jim Brown and be like, I'm still going to fight for my piece of what I think liberation is. Or you could try to find a different space, and he really did try to become like this figure of reconciliation as the country moved away from Vietnam and as he started, and especially after Zaire, where he became a fan favorite. Although a lot of folks say that really started with the loss to Frazier. Like when did he become cuddly, like sympathy, because he was actually beaten down? Part of of the faces I'm making in reaction to what you're saying is that there's also, there's the attempt sort of by the state or the institutions to to re-image somebody. There's the, the personal decision to reimage oneself. But then there's also the cultural symbolic memory of the community. Yes. So as I'm listening to you talk about these shifts to the middle or whatever, all I keep, the reason I was cringing a little bit is because as, as, a, as a young kid or a young man or whatever I was, a teenager or whatever, I, and the, the symbol was still radical, revolutionary. Wow. You know, so maybe it was part of my youth at the time, not not following all of this closely enough, or or, or but but there's something about the lingering symbol beyond what uh, the individual is is doing, or being having, or yeah, what is being done to the. No, individual. I agree, I agree, and and we also we can't. Which um, is why I'm so bothered by these posthumous yeah reimages or or the. Or the the post Parkinson's, whatever, whatever it's, timeline we're drawing. It's unconscionable. Yeah. And to be clear, the people and I saw the other thing I want to say is like the people in Ali's camp now are very aware of everything that we're talking about. Re-imaging, profiting, how to make things real. Um, His wife, Lonnie, has great respect for everything about who her husband was and also a great understanding about trying to figure out basically how to maximize his brand, basically. And so these are things that walk very uneasily together. And I, I, I interviewed today the guy who directed what I think is the best Ali documentary politically, The Trials of Muhammad Ali. And he told me this story of him meeting with her and this company called like SGX or something. I forget their name, but they're the people who basically turned Elvis Presley into a velvet right. painting. Well, and they, exactly. they, was, it was somebody, they, that guy, is, that, the CEO of that company, bought the rights to most of Elvis Presley's image, and he also bought the rights to Muhammad Ali's image. Like 80% of it. So Lonnie would still have a seat at the table, and they paid him a ton of money, and they made things like Thrilla Dilla Chilla drinks and... And rumble, young man, rumble, fruit crumbles, and and tried, and you know that's what they were trying to do. But when when Bill Siegel went to them and said, "Get the blessing," she said, "We'll help you every way we can, but it should officially be unauthorized." And she pointed right at the brand people, and she said, "So these guys have no say over it." Wow. And, could, and then she said, "We don't want a whitewash." She looked right at him and said, "We don't want a whitewash." So it's so I just find that interesting that this discussion that we're having is. I gotta be like so conscious and so freighted yeah. in their circles too. Yeah, you know, one thing I'll, I'll say about that because I wrote about it at the time when she cut that deal, and a lot of people wanted to call Ali all of a sudden a sellout. And I'm like, there's no amount of money that he could take 
to become a sellout for what he did. Exactly. Um, and then not only that, I kind of saw this as his just payback exactly. for agree. all that he for all that he surrendered and all that he did for everyone else in his surrender. Um, so and it wasn't like there was an endless pot of gold for no. him, you know, throughout the rest of his retirement no. and post career anyway. No, I mean, not you know. not at all. No, I mean, yeah. it didn't it didn't turn him into some Forbes billionaire. Yeah. Um, not his uh, prime was spent making zero right. money. Right, exactly. And this was and, and this really went in a large part to pay for his medical bills, yeah. his medical expenses, which were which were, were which were huge. And as a boxer. You don't have a 401k. Well, I was ask, you don't have no, health care. Yeah, I was going to say, there's no <laughs> retirement plan. No, there's for, no for, for, professional for, for, for boxers. boxers. Okay. A- exactly. Well, yeah. So, um, although interestingly enough, people like Joe Frazier and Larry Holmes, people who he beat and lost to, um, uh, fought for that uh, in the 90s, in the 80s and the 90s, and into the 2000s. Uh, so there, but there, there is none of that. Uh, but... You know, the other thing he was able to do, of course, with some of this money was to see the center in Louisville, which is much less a museum about yeah. boxing and much more a museum about uh, humanitarian efforts, mm-hmm. about defeating racism, um, about defeating all the isms. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's something to be said for uh, the way that that money got got spent. And this is a credit to Lonnie, too, in a big way, is that anybody who's concerned about an Ali, quote unquote, whitewash or anybody. How about this? Anybody who claims aggressively that Ali sold out or this, that or the other. I guarantee you they've never been to the Ali Center because the Ali Center is the living, breathing monument of who he was. And I've been there. I've spent hours there. It's amazing politically. It's done really, really well. And it takes no shorts with any of the politics. And so to me, it's like, who is Muhammad Ali? If someone said that to me, I would happily say go to the Ali Center without fear of the very things that you're rightly raising about the way in which he's being reimagined culturally in death. So you've got this mainstream media trying to just extract his teeth in death and make him palatable for mass consumption. But this center is almost like his last raised fist at everybody. Like, this is who I am. Let me ask you both this question. There was one, one friend of mine raised a very uncomfortable question for me about, about Ali and, and raised the question saying, how come people, more people like me with my politics are not critical of Ali for, as he said, betraying Malcolm X? Well, I mean, I think that was a development period. I mean... If we could just remind folks, because Malcolm brought him in. Right. Then there was this struggle within the nation over right. which way was Ali going to go when Malcolm right. left. And he chose to stay not with his friend and and like deep friend right. Malcolm, but with Elijah but he, and the nation. Right, but yeah, and he but. and he did. He chose to stay mm. with the nation mm. as opposed to one person. Right. Okay. Um, and I think you know. Right. He chose the collective, not he, just Elijah right, not the one individual. person. Right. right okay. Exactly. And I think he was as um, uh, as beholden over time to Elijah Muhammad as he was to Malcolm X. And he was not alone in that. I mean, there was a huge circle of folks uh, who, uh, for for him to, for him to have taken a stance against or or with Malcolm at that time, would have been uh, almost as um, uh, almost as much of a walk on the plank as him taking a stance against the Vietnam War when he did, because most Americans were in favor of the conflict in Vietnam. Um, But I also think it's interesting to point out that later on, he said on more than one occasion that he wishes he he hadn't made the decision that he made then. Yeah, um, I I also, I wish, and and interestingly, Farrakhan has said actually very similar things to uh, to Ali's quotes, that it's it's similar verbiage. It's this idea of, I wish we could have come together. I mean, you, you won't hear Farrakhan criticize Malcolm today, no. despite all the things Malcolm said about the honor of Elijah Muhammad. And there's, I, I mean, there's of course a reason for that. I mean, because Mal, it's about how Malcolm is revered, of course. Um, the the thing about, you know, you know what I think bothers me about contemporary political debate is that people think if you explain something you're excusing it and that that bothers me so much because it's like I can absolutely explain 
why Muhammad Ali did what he did and explain it in a way that, I, to me, it makes perfect sense. That certainly doesn't mean I'm excusing it. But, I mean, let's think about this for a second. He's 22 years old when this happens. 22. Not only was he 22, but he had recently made the decision not only to join the Nation of Islam, but also to cast off his financial backers, who are a bunch of white guys from Louisville who are part of the horse breeding community, and bring in the Nation of Islam to handle all of his business, all of his security. And this was a political statement. He was said, I'm not going to count on the police to protect me. I'm going to count on Fruit of Islam to protect me. I'm not going to count on these white dudes to watch my money. I'm going to get Herbert Muhammad to watch my money. Uh, you know, I'm, and so he's all in with them. Now imagine, just type what's walk it through, if he's like, Malcolm, I know you're starting these two new organizations with whoever you can bring from the nation, and that's where I'm going to at age 22. Imagine if he does that for a second. Who's watching his money now? Who's providing his security now? Do we really think that the white guys from Lexington are going to welcome him back and back him with open arms? It's like he would have been the loneliest man in the world if he had done that. And Malcolm was ready to do that because Malcolm was one of the great revolutionaries and freedom fighters to ever walk the earth. And, and the, the mistake we make is when we speak about Muhammad Ali is if he's just Malcolm with a left hook. That's just not who he was. I was just thinking, you know, the only, I think the only correct decision I did make at 22 was to read Malcolm X. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't judge, it's hard to judge someone's decision making at that age. But yeah, yeah um, <clears throat> but I think the other thing, you know, the other thing I was just underscoring is that um, Ali was a community man. He wasn't about individual. Uh, he, there's some people argue that he was about himself. That's not true. Um, he was about community. And when I think about photographs of him or film of him always surrounded by throngs of kids, throngs of kids. When he went to Africa the first time, just throngs of kids. When he went into New York, Chicago, the when first to Philly to Joe Frazier's gym, gym. To taunt him. Throng, kids came out of the neighborhood. Throngs of when kids. he went to Columbia, Maryland in I think nineteen seventy seven and could when 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 he couldn't make it. Right. And we still just sat there waiting for him. <laughs> first time <laughs> the first time I wow. met <laughs> Ali was nineteen seventy four, I believe. Um D.C. had a short-lived summer festival called Human Kindness Day. It lasted about three years, and it died due to violence. <laughs> However, to <laughs> 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 to so one of my boys and I, we, were, we took the Metro bus down to the mall, and we're just taking in all the sounds and sights, and, and we happened to be on the backside of the mall when a fleet of limos pulled up. And out jumped the greatest, Muhammad Ali. And we're just like, you got to be kidding me. And he comes over, you know, we're just a throng of teenagers. And he comes over and says something to us and passes us on the back and throws a few jabs. And he's off and he goes to the stage and he makes some, some speech. And that was the first time I ever saw him. But it was always in a mass of people. He was about, he was about community. He was about community his entire life. And the, the other thing, that, that was great. <laughs> Kev, wow. The the other thing that why well, I said the thing about like he's not Malcolm with a left hook is pe people who ask that question, it's almost like they're equating Malcolm and Muhammad as if they're like you know like, like Lenin and Trotsky sitting around like they've all read the same stuff. They're doing. I mean, Ma Malcolm read every book in the library, plus copying the encyclopedia. You know what I'm saying? It's like and he was what fifteen years older, yeah, or something like that. Yeah, fifteen years older. Family, and and so any decision Malcolm makes is going to be like, what is in the best interest of the struggle that I've devoted my life to? Like, like thinking about that very tactically. Muhammad Ali was was a boxer who had this amazing ability to for, improvise and learn on the fly very quickly. And so here, here's here's some real truth about Muhammad Ali when he first learned he was going to be drafted the things that he said and this is all on the record was he was really upset and he was like I pay so much in taxes why can't some poor kids go and fight why shouldn't I stay here and earn and make stuff 
and, and, he, and, and why do I have to be the one to go over there? And he's also saying this even though he, there's no way he would have been given a gun. He would have done USO shows probably. And, and so, but he's just very upset that he's dealing with this. He's, you know, all of this. And then he said, I ain't got no quarrel with him via Kong. And that came out of that. You fast forward from that a few years later, and he's just doing treatises in debates at Harvard and, and, and talking circles around David Frost and William Buckley about war and imperialism and all the rest of it. You see what I'm saying? And so, so it's like all of this stuff like, like with Ali. It's like he learns this stuff on the fly. He absorbs what people are saying around him and finds a way to regurgitate it in a way that's poetical in a way they could never imagine doing. And that's, that's part of it, too. And, and let's not forget, since we were talking about lineage, legacy, understanding the past, that in terms of the organization, the NOI, he knew that Elijah Muhammad was convicted of not accepting the oath of induction into the U.S. military right, right. and spent time in prison for it. Right. Wow. So, well. right, and, and, and Wallace, so you're in an organization that does not support military campaigns. So how are you then going to go out and participate in this, even if it's like a Joe Lewis? And maybe he had learned at that point, and I'm probably, and I'm sure he did, that Joe Lewis was used against black folks who at the time when at the time there was a movement of black folks not to join the military campaign in World War II because of what had happened to them coming out of World War I. So he's, he's aware of this. He's aware of this history. And you remember one of his quotes. He said people tell me I should be more like Joe Lewis. Well it's 30 years later and we're still catching hell. So what, what is this be more like Joe Lewis? But how Malcolm saw Muhammad was totally like little brother like deep deep wells of affection for his humor, for his uh, earnestness. And uh, Malcolm, he had two, um, when he was down there in Miami before the Liston fight, Malcolm was there and he would hold court with reporters and he had two lines to me that are so genius and they still speak like really directly to today. The, it speaks to people, like, like it's a, a great, when people were, I, I, I actually, I, I unearthed this Malcolm line talking about Cassius Clay when people were comparing Cam Newton to Johnny Manziel. Like, look at these two loudmouths, blah, 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 Jan Newton, Johnny Manziel. And, and he said, like, he said, look, look at Cassius Clay. He doesn't drink. He doesn't smoke. He's got a gold medal. Why isn't he the all-American boy? It was the first one. He's like, by your standards, this is what you want. And how is it that Sonny Liston all of a sudden has the white hat all of a sudden? He had the black hat until someone had to shut up Cassius Clay. Isn't that curious? That was the first one. And he's basically like, how hypocritical are you? And the second one is he said, um, you know, they say, you know, it's a clown can never imitate a wise man, but a wise man can imitate a clown. And that's the other part. Well, you think about where we are right now in terms of mass incarceration of black men. And you think about the support around Sonny Liston, who grew up as an incarcerated black man, as opposed to Muhammad Ali, who grew up as a free black man. I mean, to me, that's the, that, that's the great contrast and why white America coalesced around mm -hmm. someone like Sonny Liston, who they could own <laughs> and dominate uh, just as, exactly, exactly, despite the fact that they tried to make him out to be this big bad man. They had their hooks in him. Yeah, I mean, I mean Sonny Liston was the bad guy when Floyd Patterson was the champion. Yep. Because Floyd Patterson was a proud integrationist, as they said at the time. A proud race man who wanted to live in a suburb with his wife. And, of course, that, that didn't go too well for Floyd Patterson. But John Kennedy even contacted Floyd Patterson before he fought Liston and was like, yeah, you need to beat this guy because Sonny Liston, we don't want him representing America. They, but they did want it when it came time to shutting uh, the Louisville lip up. And James Baldwin's writings about like he followed around Sonny Liston are so amazing and he talked about Sonny Liston it's I was thinking about that today when I was reading your column because you made the call back to Harriet Tubman and slavery and it's like we, my I know you guys know this but I feel like I'm saying this for the camera here big time it's like that 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 line from Faulkner the past isn't over it's not even past I mean John Carlos is one of my become one of my best friends his grandparent was a slave grandparent not great-grandparent, grandparent. 
And so there is a culture in slave communities. If there is a young black man who's too smart, too loud, you find the biggest, meanest person to shut them the hell up. And Baldwin talked about it. He said Sonny Liston is playing this age-old role. And that's why he's now wearing the white hat. And the college man is wearing the black hat. It is deep. Well, James is deep like that. So, you always sound deep if you quote James Baldwin. 